All right. So welcome, everyone. I think we should go ahead and get started. It's three o'clock. Um, thank you for joining Environment America for today's webinar on solar group purchasing. My name is Emma Searson. I'm the Go Solar Campaign Director with Environment America. And I oversee uh, a, a few efforts with our organization, including our National Mayors for Solar Energy Project, which aims to bring cities all across the country together to advocate for and transition to a future powered by clean and renewable energy. So let me skip ahead to today's agenda. Um, I am going to start things off just by quickly introducing Environment America's Go Solar campaign and the webinar series that today's event is a part of. Then we will hear from Emily Stever, the Chief Oper Operating Officer and Vice President of Field Operations with Solar United Neighbors. She can tell us about their solar co-op program. And then next up we have Don Moreland, the President and Founder at Solar Crowdsource who can tell us about the Solarize campaigns that Solar, Solar Crowdsource has partnered on. And then our final speaker is Scott Artess, the Environmental Sustainability Manager for the City of Urbana, Illinois. And we'll hear from him about some group purchasing efforts that um, his community has seen success with. So after all of our speakers have presented, we should have plenty of time for a Q&A. So feel free to type any questions you have as they come up in the chat box, um, and we will come back to them at the end. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and get started with a quick introduction to Environment America's Go Solar campaign. So the goal of this campaign is to defend and advance solar policy at the local, the state, and the federal level. And um, we do this along with our network of state organizations with staff in over 20 states working on solar and renewable energy issues. We with those staff do research, public engagement, policy development, advocacy, media work, and we also partner with a number of other organizations, some of whom have joined us today for this event. And some of you may know Environment America for our Mayors for Solar Energy project or for the Shining Cities we report that we produce each year, which ranks major US cities by how much solar they have installed. And those projects, as well as this series, are a part of the work we're doing to further solar energy at the municipal level through our Go Solar campaign. So there are several reasons why Environment America has chosen to prioritize solar among all of the renewable energy sources you know, we encourage. Um, so first and foremost, since we are an environmental organization, um, we really care that solar is basically a pollution-free energy source, especially compared to dirty fossil fuel energy sources. Um, solar is also virtually limitless. It has no actual fuel cost because it's so abundant um, and is therefore getting more and more affordable. Uh, just to illustrate that with a quick chart, on the bottom right here, we have a circle showing the U.S. annual electricity consumption. Um, and the yellow and orange circles, which are much lar larger to the left here, represent the potential for solar energy in the U.S. Um, enough solar, uh, or excuse me, enough sunlight hits the U.S. each year to power our electricity needs more than 100 times over. So when we say solar energy is plentiful, it's kind of an understatement. Um, and there are other benefits too. Solar is a very popular energy source. It regularly polls as the most popular energy source with around 80 to 90% approval ratings consistently. And it enjoys support across party lines. Um, so no matter who you vote for or whether you consider yourself to be an environmentalist, um, more often than not, it's something you support. Uh, solar is also both tangible and transformative in our communities. We can see solar in our neighborhoods, you know, on your kids' schools, at your favorite local businesses. And when people install solar on those places, they're transforming the way they experience energy by you know, producing it themselves and seeing the impacts of that on their electric bill. Um, solar can also be deployed at really any scale to suit the need um, at the moment, whether that means on rooftops throughout a community like we see here, or that means on commercial buildings or even large farms owned by utilities or by cities. 
And finally, solar offers community benefits that are felt right, um, right there at the local level. They, solar can create local jobs, it can lower electricity costs for residents, for governments, for businesses, it can make the local electric grid more resilient and reliable. The list really goes on and on. So with all of those benefits and the fact that um, cities already usually have millions of rooftops and all the necessary infrastructure for solar energy already in place, so America's cities have a real golden opportunity to be leaders in the transition to renewable energy through solar. Um, this map shows that many are already taking advantage of that opportunity. This is from our most recent Shining Cities uh, ranky, rankings from our 2019 report, just showing some of the cities across the country that are leading the way. The bigger the bubble, the more solar these cities have installed. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of space in between these cities as well. There are plenty out there who are just starting to tap their solar energy potential and are looking for ways to do much, much more. And we know, um, oh, sorry, skipping ahead there, we know that local governments can drive further solar development through effective public policy and through programs. So part of our mission at Environment America is to provide some tools, resources, and peer learning opportunities that can help cities across the country really do that. Um, so we released a toolkit earlier this year called 10 Ways Your Community Can Go Solar. That is one example of how we're doing that. Um, and this webinar series for our Mayors for Solar Energy and the public is another. And we're hoping to enable city leaders from across the country to really learn from one another's experiences when it comes to solar energy development. So today we are gonna hear from several experts on how cities can use group purchasing programs, whether that's solar co-ops or solarized campaigns or, or otherwise, to expand access to solar in their community and get more residences and businesses to go solar. Um, so before I pass it off to our, our guest speakers, I wanna start with just you know, why, some of the reasons why you should consider group purchasing for your community. Um, you know, by definition, group purchasing programs bring customers together to negotiate better rates, to select an installer for the whole group, and um, boost demand over a limited period of time. And all types of bulk purchasing programs um, help spur development and offer uh, several benefits. So, for one, they educate the public about solar options and can create a real surge in solar installations over a relatively short period of time. Um, bulk purchasing can offer lower costs for everyone so that more businesses and residents can afford to go solar and your community can achieve your solar or renewable energy goals faster. Residents also have more control and can make more informed decisions regarding installers when they're purchasing as a group and making those choices together. And solarized campaigns and co-ops also offer an exciting opportunity to partner with local solar installers, um, nonprofit organizations, or even nearby communities for a real team effort. And then of course, they also support local installers in your community, helping them identify new customers and save on marketing costs. So it's a real win-win all around to pursue group purchasing. Um, so I wanna go ahead with that brief introduction and actually pass it off to our first guest speaker, which is Emily Steeper. Um, with Solar United Neighbors. So, Emily, you should be able to speak now and you're welcome to take the floor. Hello, uh, welcome to everyone and thank you, Emma, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm Emily Stever. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Solar United Neighbors and we have been pioneering the solar co-op model across the country and are excited to share some of our experiences. So we can go to the next slide. Wonderful. Yeah, so we got started. We're a national 501c3 nonprofit uh, founded in 2011 um, really by accident. Our founder's son, uh, Walter, and his best friend, Diego, went and saw the movie Inconvenient Truth and came home and said, Mom, we've got to do something. We've got to go solar. And so she had looked into it, and at the time, back in 2011, it was a lot more expensive, a lot more complicated. So she said, you know, if we're going to go through all this work of figuring this out, let's get some neighbors to help us. And so Walter and Diego went around the neighborhood. Um, they recruited 45 other homeowners in, in the area in Mount Pleasant, and that was the first 
solar co-op of our, of our organization. And after that first group took about um, 40 homes solar, we then started getting calls from folks all over the country. And so um, uh, created Solar United Neighbors as a formal organization. And we now have a, a community of about 110,000 people uh, across the country. Next slide. So this you can just see sort of where we're operating. Um, we're a national organization, so we do a lot of general education across the country. And then we also have on the ground staff in uh, 13 states where we're running intensive co-ops and doing um, uh, advocacy work whenever there are barriers to communities being able to adopt solar. So as Emma mentioned, um, you know, a solar co-op is really a, a group of neighbors going solar together. Uh, typically, uh, we shoot for at least 100 people in the group, uh, but more is always better. Um, the group uh, for solar co-op will form first. Uh, we'll do a number of public information sessions, and once we have a critical mass of people, which is usually at least 30 homeowners, then we'll put out a request for proposal to area installers. Uh, companies, um, any company is uh, encouraged to bid. Um, it's an open competitive bidding process. Uh, we get bids back and then members of the co-op sit down and review each of the different proposals and select a single installer to service the entire group. So um, one thing that's a little unique about solar co-ops is it's actually the co-op members that are selecting their solar installer. Uh, solar United Neighbors and the community partners, we provide a lot of technical assistance and we facilitate the process, um, but it is a, an opportunity for community members to really drive the decision making and we found as a result are very invested in the outcome and tend to have um, pretty high engagement levels with the group. So once the group selects the installers, we keep uh, recruiting additional participants and um, uh, uh, typically close out after about three or four months. Um, so most of our groups uh, get a, a relatively significant uh, discount in terms of price, but we also have um, criteria in the selection that look at things like warranties, uh, quality of equipment, uh, experience of installer, whether they're a local company, and other factors that the co-op takes into consideration so that we can ensure that all of the co-op members are getting both a great price and a, a great installation. So we stay really involved throughout the entire process. The next slide. So just a little bit of a rundown, you know, our average co-op is open to new members and new signups for about three months. Uh, we, uh, we find that nothing motivates like a deadline, so we always include de sign-up deadlines for the groups um, because most folks end up joining close to the end as they, as they learn about the opportunity and realize that they don't want to miss out. Um, so we, we also tend to cap our groups at about 225 members um, just because more than that starts to be a lot for a single company to handle handle. And sometimes we'll um, do multiple rounds or have multiple installers um, divide up the group um, if there's a lot of interest and we get a lot of traction on the co-op. Um, within our group, about 30, 30 to 50% will go solar. So um, even though not everyone that signs up for the group ends up going solar, we do find that overall it can lead to some pretty significant solar adoption in the area as folks either go solar with other companies outside of the co-op or they may be um, adopt a system further down the line. Um, our average system size is around seven kilowatts across the country. And our um, <clears throat> co-ops have at least three public information sessions for each group. So we're doing a lot of general education and outreach um, for each co-op. And we have a lot of uh, technical assistance that happens behind the scenes. On average, we're uh, answering about a thousand questions and emails um, from each co-op uh, as we go through the process and supporting folks because for a lot of people solar is still new and a little bit frightening and so we're able to support them as they get comfortable with it and, and work with their installer. Um, this is just a little bit about what we've done um, across the country. We've now um, hit over 200 co-ops, which has um, had about 30,000 people participating either at public information sessions or in the groups, and that's resulted in almost 30 megawatts of installed uh, solar capacity. So the, the neat thing about co-ops is even though it's you know individual homes, um, collectively it's starting to really add up to some major uh, 
installed capacity in the state. And then the thing that I really love is looking at the amount of money that our co-op members are investing in their local economies by going solar. Um, both by on the spending on the solar system and then also how much they're saving up front by going through the co-op process. And when each co-op ends, we do a large public celebration and party and give awards. And we like to highlight these stats because it really helps, helps um, <clears throat> local elected officials see the benefits that are happening in their communities um, by individual people adopting solar. So these are some of our um, wonderful municipal partners across the country. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, government um, groups and, and municipalities that we've worked with to organize co-ops. And um, it's, it's always a fun process. So, next slide. Um, some of the reasons that we found that people really like the bulk buys is, you know, they've got this independent voice or someone to help them navigate the process. Um, a lot of people really like that when it's a, it's a nonprofit or other third party that's helping them um, learn about solar because they don't feel like there's a sales pitch or pressure to um, go solar. And um, the process of organizing people together and doing it as a group really provides people with that impetus to kind of move forward in the decision making process. Because solar is one of those things that a lot of people want, but unlike a water heater, you know, if, if, it, if you don't have it, it's not, um, you know, it's not impacting your daily life. So it could be difficult to sort of nudge people and push them over the edge to make a decision in a timely manner. And the group process really helps with that. Next up. Um, so, you know, a couple of things we are, you know, we're really familiar with a lot of the bulk buys that happen around the country and some of our lessons learned and things that I would recommend when municipalities are looking at organizing a bulk buy is a couple of things. One is really, you know, who's doing the organizing. Um, it's really helpful to have a nonprofit or other entity that few people um, feel like they can trust and that they can um, not feel pressured, you know, sometimes we have companies, solar companies that will run um, bulk buys and, and they can work really well, but there is that element of, of trust that uh, just makes consumers a little bit more wary. Um, also making sure that the group organizing the bulk buy has a lot of technical knowledge. Um, there's a lot of back end management of the process, answering questions, um, intervening if there's something going wrong. Um, and so having a, a partner that's organizing the bulk buy with that level of knowledge really helps kind of head off any issues um, before they happen. And typically across the board, we find that, you know, 99% of our groups, things roll along really smoothly, but every now and then something will come up and um, we have a lot of NAPSEP certified staff that um, have the really deep technical knowledge so that they can intervene and identify if something, if it's an issue with, a, uh, with components or permitting or sort of whatever the problem is and then help address it. Um, another thing when you're organizing is looking at the, the plug and play versus a customized program, just in terms of ease of rollout and um, how much uh, is required on behalf of the municipality to do in terms of infrastructure and building. Um, next slide. And then another piece that we've, we've helped some municipalities work through is um, when you're organizing a bulk buy, um, just being aware of who's making the decision for who the solar contractor is for the group. Um, sometimes if the municipality is involved in that decision making, it can trigger some of those procurement requirements, you know, RFPs and other things. So either ensuring that, like in our case, the co-op members are the ones making the decision, which helps create some of that space. Um, but if that's not the case, then um, I'm making sure that the procurement process meets your local requirements. And then also, um, you know, consumer advocacy, making sure that someone's there looking out for the consumers and monitoring the process and is able to really um, uh, guide homeowners uh, who have a lot of questions and um, are often the best champions for the process and for solar once they've gone through and, and have learned a lot and are able to advocate for more neighbors going solar. Um, we also just, you know, for, area, for municipalities that aren't ready for a bulk buy, there's a lot of other educational things that we do in other groups. Our National Solar Tour is a national network of solar open houses all over the country where folks can go and check out solar in their neighborhood. And that, things like that are a great way for um, residents to learn about solar, even if um, there's not a, a bulk buy happening in the area. So I think that's it.
but yeah, that's me. So uh, happy to answer any questions or chat with folks if, if you'd like to learn more. Awesome. And I think um, I saw these other two slides on kind of your co-op process and things municipalities can do. Are those things you wanted to dig into? Uh, those were just if there were more in-depth questions, but okay. happy to, folks want to dig into the weeds of the co-op process later on. We're happy to, happy to do that. Perfect. Well, then I will keep those in mind. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, great to hear a little bit more about your co-op programs. I know they're successfully spreading solar um, in lots of parts of the country. Um, and I think we'll probably get a similar, um, you know, information about a different program um, through Don with Solar Crowdsource. So I'm just going to switch over speakers real quick. Don, you should um, be unmuted and ready to go. Um, so go ahead and take the floor and thanks so much for joining us. All right. Well, thank you very much and uh, pleasure to speak with everyone that joined us today. Uh, our model is called a solarized model, and it might be a term that some of you have I've heard before. Uh, it is a little bit different than the co-op model in a couple of fundamental ways that I'll highlight as we go through this. Um, but uh, what, what we're going to focus on is really the process and what a Solarize uh, program is and how they're formed and some of the key components to a Solarize program that are important to think about as you, as you think about whether this may be a good fit for your community. Um, you can go ahead and click over, <laughs> Emma, on a bunch of that. I, I, I didn't realize that I had animated some of this stuff, but sure, no okay, way. stop right, right there. So <laughs> Solarize uh, programs, they are uh, very similar to the co-ops. They're community-based group purchasing programs, and the, the, the key things behind them is that uh, they make solar energy and, and now battery storage more affordable and accessible than than outside of a solar rice program. Uh, we look at policies and we try to tackle barriers to make solar more affordable and to reduce the soft costs of, of solar. Um, <coughs> uh, solar rice programs are not new. Uh, they started originally in 2009. The Department of Energy funded, I think it was Portland, Oregon, a a grant to start the first ever solar group purchasing program that we know of. And since then, the model has proliferated a great deal and there's been over 30, 300 solar age programs across the country. Um, our program is, is uh, it's, it's not an installer based program. It's truly a community based program, which I'm going to point out here in a second. And um, it's also a market based solution. So, Solar Crowdsource is a for-profit entity. I've always been a social entrepreneur and trying to figure out how we can harness the, the power of the free market to bring you know, new renewable energy solutions to market. And so uh, ours is a bit of a twist. Rather than relying on a grant or some other kind of funding from a federal or, or state agency, um, we have developed a model where Solar Crowdsource will, will work together with the local community and, and de develop it and, and uh, provide all the upfront costs and all the resources that come to bear to bring a solar rice program uh, to fruition. And then our model is to be paid back by the selected contractor as a portion of the gross proceeds. So what that means is that there's no out-of-pocket cost to the community or no startup money is required. And we found, especially in Georgia, that has been the model that works because not a lot of communities have the, the extra money on hand to, to start a solar rights program. <clears throat> so the components of a solar ice program, uh, and I'm just gonna run through these, but then I, I wanna look at it through a lens of a campaign that we have already done. But uh, first we want to do a policy assessment of the local community. We want to uh, look at what kind of permitting policies they have in place, what kind of utility policies and rate designs they have, what kind of city council support we may have and, and other uh, 
other things that might affect the cost and viability of whether you know solar is even going to make sense in that community in the first place. Um, then we look at design and planning. Um, uh, these are from beginning to end about 12 month programs. Uh, it takes about three months to organize and then within that three months you have a 30 day request for a proposal period and, uh, and then the program will run for about four or five months and then we allow some extra time to have installations uh, uh, done. So really from, from the first meeting that we have when we sit down with the community uh, through the last installation, it could easily be a 12 month period of time. So uh, we, we definitely want to be cognizant of that and design and plan the campaign accordingly. Um, community organizing is, is the next one and you'll see in the program I'm gonna sh uh, share with you, the community partners are extremely important and that means just more than the, the, the municipality that, that, that might be involved, but other local nonprofit entities uh, that have a, a, a stake in seeing a more sustainable community and, and that advocate for environmental and, and clean energy initiatives. And uh, luckily, there's not a shortage of those. You're, you're seeing more and more of them pop up. Very concerned citizens are, are organizing and you're seeing more sustainability committee offices pop up everywhere. Um, so, and then we do our request for proposal. That's usually a 30 day period where we send a request proposal out to the solar industry. We advertise in the public newspaper for four consecutive weeks. We try to do everything we can to mimic the local community's procurement rules to the extent that it, it, uh, it makes sense. And, um, and we just find doing that, doing the RFP and doing it in a way that is, is in compliance with local procurement rules brings a lot of credibility to the campaign. And then there's a period of onboarding where we, we have selected the contractors. So like the co-ops, we'll have one or two contractors, um, uh, usually one, but I'm gonna show you an example where we did have two. And um, uh, we need to onboard them, create the website. We have a, a CRM with automated marketing. We do a lot of print media and social media channels. We have to establish those. So that's part of the onboarding process. And then education and outreach. So once the program has launched, there is a very intense education and marketing uh, and, and outreach campaign that goes throughout the duration of, of the campaign, which is usually, you know, we try to make a big splash with the launch event and get as much attention from that as possible, including issuing a press release that could get picked up by the local media. Um, uh, obviously, we do a lot of work through social media, workshops, info se in information sh sessions at local libraries and, and churches and places of worship. Solar open houses are, are becoming really uh, important events for us so, so people can come out and see and touch and feel what exactly a, a solar project looks like. So we'll do those in conjunction with the campaign. And then, you know, lunch and learns and talking with civic organizations and uh, trying to participate in as many community festivals and events as possible. That's all part of the outreach and the education. Okay, and then you can go on to the next one. So I wanted to show you how all this works with our Solarize Atlanta campaign. This is a campaign that ran throughout 2018. And you can see, if you look at your screen, the number of, of uh, nonprofit partners that we had work in conjunction with the program, including the local Environment America branch, Environment Georgia, and Georgia Interfaith Power and Light. We had uh, uh, the econo economic development folks, the city of Atlanta, U.S. Green Building Council, Sierra Club, and some others. Um, and again, the more local community support you can get for these programs, the, I think the more successful you're gonna be. So let's see how all this works in action. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so the policy assessment for the city of Atlanta was real easy for us because Atlanta had just made a commitment to 100% clean energy by 2035. 
So uh, uh, the SolarEyes program was actually written into their plan on how to get to 100%, and uh, we will be doing multiple SolarEyes Atlanta programs um, uh, from now through 2035. Um, but it's nice to, to be working on the, on the heels of such an exciting announcement from the city of Atlanta. Um, we had also worked with the city of Atlanta to, to streamline their permitting process. This is before we even got started, but we knew we wanted to do a program there. So we started working with their permitting team early and um, they adopted a streamlined permitting process that uh, really made it easy and affordable for permitting, uh, thereby reducing the soft costs. And then uh, we had great city support. We got a unanimous resolution from the city endorsing clean renewable energy and the campaign as a way to go about doing it. So um, it, the, the, the local support usually starts with the municipality and Atlanta. Uh, they really did a great job with this campaign. The design and planning for campaign for, for the campaign. So we looked at the city of Atlanta and we decided that is a big area to, to work in. So um, we decided we needed to break it up into a residential campaign running simultaneously with a commercial campaign. And we did our request for proposals accordingly. So for this particular campaign, we did a separate request for proposal for a residential contractor and then one for a commercial contractor. Um, Atlanta has a lot, so I'm back to design and, and planning. Atlanta has a lot of outdoor activities, especially in the spring and in the fall. So we wanted to time the campaign to coincide with as many of those um, uh, as those events as possible. So um, we did start the campaign in the early spring and then we concluded it in, in the fall and we were able to capture as much of those local events as possible while also avoiding the holidays. The, you know, uh, running a campaign during the holidays and as far as Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's is uh, it's difficult to maintain people's attention and um, and, and sometimes things can get lost. I can tell you from personal experience, it's not, uh, not always a good time to run a campaign. Um, and then community organizing. So for the Atlanta campaign, we took all of those nonprofit organizations that you saw on the previous page and everybody went self-identified, well, I wanna be on the residential working group, I wanna be on the commercial working group, and I wanna be on the equity commercial group. So we had, um, uh, we had a really great um, uh, group of people who were committed to helping get the word out and advocate and educate for residential, commercial, and the low income and um, and challenged communities aspect, and also nonprofits was was the, the equity group was equity and nonprofits, which is always a, a different market. Um, I talked about the request for proposal. Um, the onboarding, we, we went out and got the SolarizeATL.com uh, website, and that was real easy for people to remember. With all the social media platforms, you, you, know, you have to have a hashtag, <laughs> um, and, and that proved well for our Twitter communications and, and things of that nature. And our print media, which you'll see some examples here in a minute, but um, there's a lot of brochures, flyers, uh, banners, signs and other things that, um, that that cost money up front, you know, the graphic design that goes with that, that, uh, you know, it's important to help brand the campaign and to, you know, make sure that people understand that uh, there is a large community effort to bring down the cost of solar and make it easier for people to participate. And then the education outreach, I, I think I talked about before, but um, uh, we did uh, at least eight workshops four open houses. We did a, a lot of uh, uh, festivals and a lot of other events. And if you want to go ahead, and, Emma, if you want to go to the next slide, we can see some examples of that. The top right photo is, that was our launch event. We had over 130 people come out and learn more about what we're trying to do. Some of the other pictures below are some festivals that we participated in. And you can see some of the signage that we had created for the campaign. Um, and uh, and farmers markets we did you know a lot of uh, there's a few breweries around town so 
solar and beer always goes very well together. And, um, and, and those folks at breweries were happy to have us out and help promote what they're doing. We created some fun memes and, you know, tried to get people's attention in, in several different ways. Uh, we had t-shirts and, and, and flyers for just about every event. We have a flyer that we try to use to help get the word out. So that in conjunction with a lot of press releases, certain milestones of the campaign, you, you want to try to get the word out and that includes your launch event, your first installation, reaching certain goals, um, a certain amount of CO2 avoided, things like that, or things you want to celebrate. And so we'll issue a press release and uh, quite often those will get picked up by the local press. And those are, it's a, it's a very important way to get the word out in these campaigns. All right, so um, here's just the results of the, the Atlanta campaign. Sorry if the, the, the print was small, but we had uh, over a thousand people sign up, uh, 149 contracts. Most of those were residential. Um, uh, the Atlanta program was our most successful program in Georgia so far. Uh, and um, uh, we really got the price out. The, the pricing for the Atlanta program came down to about $2.40 a kilowatt uh, hour, or a kilowatt, or, or I'm sorry, per watt, which is, is the cheapest we've seen in Georgia. So that just kind of goes to show that the model is working. We have a competitive bid process. We're able to get the price down. Um, we're able to, like Emily said, it's a plug and play. So we've already done all the vetting for the contractor, the pricing, the materials that are going to be used, the warranties, and all that kind of thing. So it, it really takes the guesswork out of people participating. And so we, we uh, did just shy of a megawatt in this campaign, about 850 kilowatts. And we did a lot of batteries to over a half a megawatt hour of energy storage for this campaign. And um, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Emily, just a, we've done several programs here in Georgia. We've done one outside of Georgia. We are constantly looking for new opportunities. Um, but uh, here's just an example of some of our artwork and logos that we've created for, for these programs. We've done eight of them so far in Georgia. And the next slide, Emma, we just kind of share some of our progress. Um, over to, to 450 installations, um, over three megawatts. And, and again, we're selling lots of batteries and other programs as well. So over one megawatt hour of batteries. And then the number of folks who participated in our workshops and education events is you know over 6,000. And, and we like to keep track of how much CO2 we're avoiding as well. Um, Environment Georgia has been an important partner throughout all of our campaigns, as well as Gipple. And um, it's, uh, we don't lose sight on the environmental attributes of these campaigns and how important it is for our environment moving forward. And that is, is that. Um, again, my name is Don Moreland. You can reach me at don at solarcrowdsource.com or you just go to solarcrowdsource.com and contact me through there. And um, I wanna thank you for all for listening and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Don. Um, that was excellent to hear. I think it's fun to hear um, first from Solar United Neighbors and get the, you know, nonprofit model of a, you know, program aimed at spreading solar, making it easier for people and then hear a, you know, similar but for profit model with your organization and kind of based in Georgia. So I very much appreciate that um, contrast. Um, and I'm sure people will have questions. I know I have some for you um, as well, but um, for the time being, I'm gonna go ahead and um, pass the floor over to Scott Tess um, with the city of Urbana um, to hear a little bit about some you know, real world uh, solarized campaigns on the ground in his community. Um, so Scott, you are, are welcome to take the floor whenever you're ready. Great, uh, do I have control of the Slides? Um, no, you're just going to have to tell me next. I'm sorry okay. about that, um, but I will do my best to keep up with you. And I'm on the phone. Do you want to mute me on the sure. computer? All right, you're all muted on the computer. I think me. Um, it was great. On the, on the um, computer, I, I muted you and then I couldn't hear anything.
Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, that's perfect, thanks. Great, okay. Um, I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna hang up on the phone because I can't hear it on the computer. Is that gonna work? Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me. There was so much from Don and Emily's presentation um, that really uh, was a shared experience for us. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, just wanna mention that we're doing a lot in solar. Um, right now we're hoping to finish up the, the SoulSmart process. We're, we have plenty of points um, to get silver, but we're, we're missing one of the prerequisites. So we hope to wrap that up um, next month at the Planning Commission. Next slide. Um, I wanna mention that we are now in, in our second, third year of our uh, Solar Urbana Champagne program. Um, we're working within the context of the Illinois Future, Jobs Act, Future Energy Jobs Act. That is um, an enormous incentive package with lots of different carve outs. But that's really been helpful, good timing in our second year for our bulk solar purchase program. And uh, right now, what we're exploring is some of the low, in low, uh, low income incentive carve outs. So we're working really hard this year to recruit um, lower income households to get involved with solar in our community as well. Next slide. So we try and keep our program rooted in behavioral sciences, specifically uh, community-based social marketing. And I'm gonna simplify that and say that that's looking at what are your barriers to the behavior you're interested in, and then what are the uh, limited types of interventions that are, have been shown to actually increase um, the behavior that you're looking for. So in our area, we are thinking about the complexity barrier so solar seems more complicated than a typical home or small business improvement. We're thinking about the social norming behavior. If it's not something that a lot of people there are doing, people tend not to do it. Um, we're thinking about the information barrier, although you know the internet has all the information in the world, so I'm not sure that's a huge barrier. We do think that the uncertainty barrier is very substantial, so that's confidence that oh, this really is something that is a good deal for me, I can trust this installer, that sort of thing. Obviously the cost barrier is huge, and so we have a couple ways that we're working to lower the costs for solar. And then the attention barrier, um, folks have busy lives and uh, wanna be able to capture their, their attention and keep it long enough to um, get them to convert to a solar installation. Next slide. So in terms of interventions, we think of them in terms of easy, fast, cheap, popular. Easy is you know, checking our planning zoning permitting. Uh, we're doing that with SoulSmart right now. We have really fast permitting times already in Urbana, Illinois. So that's not a huge barrier for us, but it's something to consider. Um, fast, we wanna move people through the process before they get bored or distracted. So um, we have short permit permitting times in Urbana. We, uh, with our bulk solar purchase program, we're cutting some of the time out because we do that process of getting three quotes, so to speak, for a home improvement project or, or a, a, a small business improvement project. Cheap, so we do a competitive bid to drive down the price, and then we also have volume-based discounts. So the more people uh, who sign up for a solar installation, the lower the price. And then popular, um, so we do public education, ribbon cuttings, Facebook, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our solar power hours in a bit. Uh, next. So this is our model, three party, four part. We have a, a local partner. That's kind of the trusted name that stands behind the program for us. That's the city of Urbana. Uh, we partner with a trusted nonprofit administrator of our bulk solar purchase program. For us, that's the Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Um, the, the local partner provides kind of the local intelligence, where to go, who to talk to, what's a good venue for solar power hour, and the nonprofit brings the experience of administering these bulk solar purchase programs um, and, and running the solar power hour. And then the third party is the solar installer. That's someone who obviously knows how to install solar energy systems, and we use a competitive selection for that. The four parts are the installer procurement. So that's really important. That's 
led by the nonprofit partner. So they're the ones that are uh, signing an agreement uh, for the bulk solar purchase program with the installer. However, they do that in consultation with the local advisory committee that actually does the qualifications based selection of the solar installer. So that contract has a bulk solar initial price and then at certain volumes of sales, I think it's 50 KW, 150, uh, 200, 250, something like that. Um, we have price breaks, additional uh, discounts in the dollars per watt uh, installed price. We, we use a limited time offer, again, as, as others had mentioned, to uh, get folks off the fence and commit. And then the most important part, we do about 15 or 20 solar power hours over the course of six or seven months. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. And the fourth part is the installer to owner contracts. So me as a city of Urbana employee, we, we don't sign any contracts, the city. MREA signs a contract with the installer, but has no participation in the individual contracts between the homeowner or the business owner and the installer. Next slide. So this is um, what our bulk solar purchase or what our uh, solar power hours look like. So this is a one hour educational event. We tell people everything they need to know about basics of solar energy science, um, basics of getting a solar energy system for your home or business, and then also the elements of our bulk solar purchase program. We'll also show folks uh, a scenario for a home and a scenario for a business, um, how, you know, how big the system might be, what that would cost, additional adders, which also have fixed pricing in our program. So folks come away from our solar power hours as very, very savvy solar purchasers. And from here, um, they're put on the list for a site assessment, and our installer kind of takes over at that point, does a site assessment, gives them a proposal, and at that point, we hope they convert to a contract. Next slide. This is some more photos of our solar power hours. I'm, sh I'm dwelling on this because it's really important in our model. Our uh, Peter Murphy with the Midwest Renewable Energy Association in his experience doing these types of programs throughout the Midwest, says that almost everyone who ends up signing a contract for a solar installation attended a solar power hour. So we are constantly talking to people who say, oh, I don't know, I don't, I don't need to go to that, I know enough, I'll look it up on the internet, just tell me the price. And it turns out that those folks, they don't convert. So our whole, public engagement effort is about getting folks to attend a solar power hour. Now looking at these photos, starting from top left, moving to bottom right, we have a library, a church, a brewery, a church, a brewery, and then the last one is a brewery that used to be a church. So we seem to get a lot of action at breweries and churches. So um, I would suggest that to others. Next slide. So these are the types of appeals that we focus on in our advertising, marketing, and our solar power hour. Obviously, there's a rational appeal, and, and people do want to hear that. What's the cost? What's the payback period? So on. Um, however, we try to stay focused on the um, some of the social and emotional appeals as well, because in the science, those are more powerful. Next slide. So this is some of our social norming. On the left is the mayor at a ribbon cutting for a solar installation at a local church. And on the right is the installation of a small solar array that is powering the city of Urbana's Arbor Shop. So that's the lead by example show that it is a thing that's viable that normal people like you do here. Next slide. This is the outcomes from our solar power hours. Um, obviously 2019, we're not finished yet. You see we educate a few hundred people and generate a few hundred leads uh, for our installer. And we've got in three years about one and a half megawatts of solar installed. You'll see in the second to last column, 
um, the base dollars per watt that we secure through our competitive purchase. It's kind of been fixed at $299. That's not because that's the lowest you can get. Um, as I mentioned before, we do a qualifications-based selection. So in 2019, the lowest base dollars per watt proposal we got was actually $2.60. Um, however, we use the points-based system to select the installer. And there are points for other things like experience. Uh, so the, the um, lowest cost is, was not the vendor selected this year. Next slide. Oh, that's it. I will be happy to take any questions you have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. Great to hear about the the model in your community. And then just looking at this this slide before. Um, the I, know I cannot hear anything. Um, okay. Um, hopefully other folks can hear me okay. I realize um, Don is having a little trouble hearing. Um, so put a, put a note in the chat if you oh, there we go. Know, can't hear. Got it. Um, <laughs> Glad to hear. Um, so I, I just really appreciate hearing a little bit more about that model, seeing just on this slide the impact that your Solarize efforts have had on the ground. And um, other folks are welcome to ask questions in the chat, but um, I will start off with one for you, Scott. Um, it was just really great to hear you touch really briefly on how Solarize and your, your bulk purchasing has overlapped with other solar efforts in com your community, you know, leading by example, you know, having a soul smart designation. I'd love to hear just a little bit more about how those pieces of your local strategy fit together. Sure. So when we started our solar work, you know, we had very, a very rational plan and then everything got out of order, of course. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, let's first make sure we have no unnecessary regulatory barriers. Mm -hmm. Well, that was like five years ago and we still haven't finished that up. So while that seems like it should come first, we moved on to other things. Uh, the second thing we wanted to do was to lead by example and get a solar installation at one of our own facilities. That did happen kind of simultaneously with our first bulk solar purchase program. Um, and then the last scale, which we are also still working on, is we own a closed municipal landfill and we're working, we, we've done a qualifications-based selection uh, for a, a large-scale solar developer to do um, a, a two megawatt, two to six megawatt solar array that would utilize one of the state incentives, um, potentially a community solar array, depends on how all the incentives work out. So we're working, we're working at all scales, commercial and residential, um, and we're going to keep doing this, the solarize as long as we keep getting a lot of uh, a lot of sales out of it. Sure, awesome. Yeah, it's great to hear that kind of all of the above strategy. Those are all things. Environment America, and I'm sure others on this call are always encouraging uh, cities to consider. Um, Emily and Don, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you um, both as well. Um, one question I just have for, for everyone here um, is, is, first of all, where people can go uh, to find out, you know, the very next step if they want to pursue your model, whether that means, you know, get involved with Solar United Neighbors or Solar Crowdsource, kind of what your, your top resource would be. And then if there's any other kind of last word of a word of wisdom you'd like to add on in our last couple of minutes. Yeah. This is Emily, I can, I can go first. Um, I, I think if folks wanna see generally what we're up to, you can check out our website at solarunitedneighbors.org. Um, and if um, there are folks that wanna talk specifically about how we could do a potential co-op in your area, um, shoot me an email, I'm emily at solarunitedneighbors.org. And we're, um, we're always looking for um, where to do our next co-op. So we to partner with folks. And I think, you know, the thing that we, um, see over and over again and the, the reason that my job is really fun is that uh, you know people are really excited about solar they're a little bit daunted but given the opportunity to learn about it and feel like they're making an informed decision um, they get really jazzed up and we have had some amazing community partners and volunteers do all sorts of outreach on behalf of the co-ops and you know we've had a number of local mayors win national awards and get major press coverage on uh, local solar co-op work so there's a lot of opportunities um, to get folks excited about it, and uh, I think that the communities have generally been really uh, thrilled whenever there's a co-op in their area. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right, I'll go next. Uh, this is Don Moreland with Solar Crowdsource, and you guys can find out about Solar Crowdsource at solarcrowdsource.com. That's all one word. And um, when you get there, you can look at the active campaigns and archived campaigns. And, and uh, it, one of the things that we are trying to incorporate into our model is a crowdfunding mechanism whereby nonprofit entities within a solar rise program can raise funds, uh, you know, for their solar projects. Um, it's a new feature. Uh, we have one crowdfunding program going on at uh, uh, in in St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands of all places, but um, we're looking to raise some money for low income and nonprofit entities that are you know, looking to reduce their electricity bill and therefore apply more of their resources toward mission related activities. Um, if you're interested in looking at our model and, and talking with us more about it, then feel free to contact me direct at don at solarcrowdsource.com. And uh, I would say the last piece I would want to leave you guys with is there's no time like the present. And there's, uh, there's some kind of macroeconomic drivers that are compelling folks to act quickly um, rather than waiting until later. And just to briefly touch on those, the cost of solar has come down dramatically over the past few years. Um, I think you know, it's around 70, 75% since 2010. Uh, the, the pricing is kind of leveling off. There are some policy headwinds that the solar market is facing in terms of uh, uh, tariffs uh, by the current administration with solar and for, for uh, steel and aluminum imports and, and things like that. So we have not seen the price go up but we haven't seen the price really go down either in the last 18 months or so. So um, uh, uh, that in conjunction with the fact that there's a 30% federal tax credit that begins to phase out at the end of this year. Um, so it'll be 30% this year, but then it'll go down to 26% next year and then 22% in 2021 and so forth and so on until I think in 2023 for residential, uh, we won't have a, a tax credit available and, um, and commercial will level out at 10%. So if you're able to monetize those tax credits and you're interested in using tax credits to help reduce the upfront cost of solar, then there's a window of opportunity now to, to get going and, um, and it'll be important to do so. And then finally, utility rates tend to go up. I don't know of many utilities that, that where, you know, where the rates are going down, some utility rates are going up uh, faster than others. But you know, solar works as a hedge against raising utility rates because there's very little operating and maintenance and you, uh, you don't have to um, uh, uh, you know, spend a lot of money on fuel. The sun is free and, um, and you can monitor everything on your phone or on your computer. So um, uh, I think for those three reasons, there's a little window of opportunity if you're interested in getting your, the residents of your community engaged with solar, then I would urge you to act uh, sooner than later on that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, excellent. I definitely agree with that sentiment. Um, and since we're, we're coming up on four, just a few seconds here, I want to just um, throw two more resources on the screen for folks. Um, first is the toolkit I mentioned earlier um, with you know, different ways and um, guides for how cities can pursue solar um, now. And then second is a link to join our Mayors for Solar Energy um, group um, so that you can learn more about educational opportunities like this one. Um, and take advantage of all the resources we're putting out there. Um, as well as my contact information, I know our speakers shared theirs for the most part, but I'm also happy to provide any connections after the fact um, and be useful in that way. Um, so thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing um, some of your, your words of wisdom today. Um, I really enjoyed it. 
And thank you everyone for, for joining and listening. I hope it was helpful.